Okay, thank you for having me. My name is Damien Fair, and I'll be talking about ABCD and the imaging measures and data availability for the ABCD study. I have one conflict uh, to describe. Myself and Nico Dosenbach are co-founders of Naus Imaging, uh, which is a, uh, a which is currently commercializing the firm motion monitoring software products. There's one slide on, on firm, so I wanted to make sure to highlight that. There are several learning objectives for this, for this lecture. Uh, one will be going over the imaging protocol and pulse sequences, a section on quality assurance, uh, a section on fMRI and its task description, justification, relevance to ABCD, We'll be going over the minimally, minimally processed pipelines, then also talking about the ABCC or the ABCD bids community collection, section 3165 on the NDA, and some of the data utilities and data available on uh, that collection as well. All right, imaging protocol and pulse sequences. So much of what I'll be, I'll be, I'll be talking about today is, is published in a few papers. Um, I'll kind of sprinkle those papers throughout the talk here. The first one here is by BJ Casey from back in 2018, which is the general description of the imaging and the imaging protocol. The ABCD imaging protocol starts with the pre-scan, uh, lasts 25 to 45 minutes. It includes a rescreen for uh, contraindications for MRI, uh, uh, simulations and motion compliance training, practice fMRI tests and pre-scan questionnaire. And from there, sites can choose from one of two options of a single scan session, which lasts about 90 to 120 minutes and includes all of the modalities, the localizer, T1, resting state, diffusion, uh, DTI, a T2, um, again, a rest, another resting state scan, and then the task-based fMRI after. Or there's a two-scan session which splits up all those modalities into uh, two scans with a post-questionnaire uh, break and pre-scan questionnaire in between. The end of the uh, scan session includes a 15 to 20 minutes of post-scan questionnaire, a recognition memory tests, and also the post-MID survey. The acquisition protocols were initially based on the Human Connectome project. The resolution for the structural and the functional data were pulled back, reduced uh, quite a little bit um, to increase the signal to noise. We thought this was important because of the, the limited amount of data collected for the study relative to the uh, HCP study, uh, and, and the, and which helped increase the signal to noise and also due to the nature of, of scanning kids. But we harmonized the imaging scanning parameters across three platforms, the Siemens, Philips, and uh, GE. For REST, uh, there was decided to collect between 15 and 20 minutes of data collected. This was based in part um, on a study by uh, Tim Lauman and colleagues describing um, the reliability of within subject functional connectivity. Here using data from the Poldrome or Russ Poldrack, which who had collected approximately 14 hours of data um, within one subject. Um, that data was split up into, into a half, which is as a baseline, and then the other half was used to subsample the data to identify how many minutes is required to reach uh, stabilization or replicability. Um, and in this study, in, in, in B kind of shows those curves. The furthest left point on there is approximately 10 minutes of 10 minutes of good data. At about 20, about 12 and a half minutes of good data, you reach about halfway up that curve. Uh, and that was in part the rationale to try to reach up to 12 and a half minutes of, of good movement-free data with uh, ABCD, which require in some participants 15 minutes and other participants up to upwards of 20. Okay, so quality assurance measures. Our quality assurance has for ABCD has been evolving since the start of the study. We're now at release 3.0. 
there are several measurements in the, the tabulated data that, can, that will help make decisions on inclusion and exclusion of, of data for given investigators. ABCD has its own recommended uh, imaging inclusion parameters um, in, that, in that sheet for folks to view. We'll be going over bits of all of that uh, throughout this uh, talk. The first part is that will be on the um, will be on the QC of the raw data. There's several parts here. Then there'll also be QC, there's also QC in the on the post-process data as well. Um, and so we'll go over bits of all of that. So the first part of QC is protocol compliance checking that is performed by on-site you know, workstations that provides feedback to scan operators. Out of, out of compliance series are re reviewed by DIC staff. Uh, criteria include whether key imaging parameters match expected values for a given scanner, um, voxel size, repetition time, et cetera, presence or absence of given scan type, like, be, like the distortion field maps, et cetera. And then each imaging series is checked for completeness to avoid any missing files. There are several um, uh, automated quality control metrics for structural MRI that includes mean and standard deviation of brain values in spatial SNR, uh, diffusion, uh, mean motion using frame-wide displacement is calculated. That, that also occurs for the, the functional MRI. And for diffusion, the number of slices and frames affected by slice drop, uh, dropout is, is recorded, as well as for a functional MRI, the number of seconds, the amount of time that uh, good data exists for displacements of less than 0 0.2, 0 0.3, or 0 0.4. Um, and there's also a temporal SNR measurement that's used. During acquisition in real time, all the Siemens sites and hopefully soon the GE and, and Philips sites as well use the firm software for, for motion, moni motion monitoring. This allows a little bit of flexibility to, for um, once you've hit that 12 and a half minute time point, if you, to save time on the final five minutes of, final five minutes of a run. And it also helps for helping the um, uh, training of participants um, by, by some of the sites. Okay, so there's an ABCD MRI. Um, so some of there's a manual review of all the data that comes in. Um, this, in essence, reviewers assign a binary QC score. The, the images that are reviewed include most of all the types of images that are acquired and then and in essence, are inspecting for signs of artifacts or poor image quality. Um, a lot of this documentation is available um, on the MDA. Again, I apologize for a lot of the text here, but I, I, I figured as, as folks are wanting to dig in or looking at this lecture and want to understand some of the details that we can at least provide it here. But there's also some, there's also free surf for QC that's, that's also manual. Um, to review the cortical surface reconstruction. Again, the reviewers assign a binary score, um, gauge the severity of, of different types of artifacts, uh, motion, intensity, inhomogeneity, et cetera. Uh, a numer numeric value is assigned on a scale from zero to three with regard to these types of artifacts. Um, a QC score of zero assigned if severity score, um, sorry, QC score of zero is a sign of severity score is of three for any type of artifact. And just of note, regardless of the these of these scores, that the, the all the data, regardless of the score, is shared um, in the tabulated data, regardless of the post-processing QC. So for diffusion, <coughs> um, Post-processing QC is, you know, for manual QC, again, reviewers assign a binary score for severe artifacts and irregularities. Um, and then reviewers gauge the severity of uh, similarly five types of artifacts um, and are given, a, are given a sign a score of zero to three, similar to the free surfer. And again, a, a QC score of zero is assigned if the severity score of any of these is 
um, three for any type of artifact. For fMRI, the same, the same story, binary score, zero or one, several types of artifacts are viewed. Um, same, similarly, giving numeric values of zero to three, uh, and then it, the, the scan is rejected if, if any uh, severity score of any of these measurements is, is, is a three. There are also several automated post-processing QC measures that accompany the manual QC measures. Um, for, for free surfer, <clears throat> number of topological defects are calculated. Um, for the diffusion and fMRI, field of view and brain, brain cutoff measurements are calculated. Uh, the, the quality of the registration is estimated um, as well for, for, those, for those measurements as part of QC. For more details, you can, you can read through the, the talk here um, after it's available. Now, there are several recommendations based on all of these QC measures that, that the ABCD uh, study then recommends for inclusion. Um, they're based on criterion for the criterion that exists in the tabulated data, the element values you can see here and what the instrument is. We won't go over the details of this, but I'll just kind of fly through a little bit of what is what happens for um, for all these different data types. So here's the T1 when it's recommended for inclusion. Uh, here, here's the T2, which, in, which includes measurements from the T1 and FreeSurfer. So the diffusion data becomes a little bit more uh, complicated, uh, but there are several additional measures that can be used for this, for this recommendation. Again, the details, all the, all the details can be seen and found online. For, and the same for resting state data. And then the task data include a few additional, uh, uh, a few additional measures um, with regard to E prime for their inclusion. So I'm just gonna fly through these, but again, feel free to come back to look at all the details when you have time. Okay, so fMRI, the task description, justification, and relevance to ABCD. So the, uh, the first task here, the uh, monetary incentive delay task, here participants attempted to win or avoid uh, losing money by quickly responding to acute stimuli using a response box in their dominant hand. There are uh, 50 contiguous trials, uh, 10 per trial type, each of two runs. The target duration is based on the participant's performance during a practice session. Prior to scanning uh, and adjusted during the scan to targeting approximately 60% accuracy. Uh, and the task performance is translated into actual payment amounts uh, for the participants. Circles are for the win, um, squares are for the lose, and then the no win or loss um, in the triangles, as you can see in the, in the figure here. The stop signal, um, the stop signal task was also used. Um, the SST, says ST presented leftward or rightward facing arrows in serial order for the go stimuli. Participants are then instructed to as quickly and as accurately as possible um, to um, to not respond to the signal when the arrow is pointed upward, that is, that is the stop signal. There's two runs, each had 180 trials, of which 30 are the stop trials. And the time between the go and the stop, stop signals um, vary dynamically based on a, a participant's success on the prior trial so as to achieve 50% uh, success rate. And then the third task is the emotional end back task. Um, two runs, each containing eight blocks, um, half of which are zero back and half are two back. Each block contains 10 trials, uh, two of which are targets. 
The face stimuli include the happy, fearful, and neutral face, facial expressions uh, from NIMSTEM and racially diverse effective expressions um, um, irradiate uh, another set, different set of stimuli. Um, there's additional images of places as used as a fourth stimuli um, here. And then again, um, post scan is a, a recognition memory test. All right, so there are several principles on which these tasks were chosen. One first is based on uh, implication and addiction. Uh, second was the feasibility in developmental studies. Third, uh, well characterized uh, neural activations. Um, fourth, reliable activation over time within subjects. Uh, five, consistent patterns of activity across subjects. And six, leveraging of other complementary developmental imaging initiatives that use similar measures. Okay, so a couple of notes here. Task order is varied, but held constant within families and over time for our participant. Um, and there are num numerous stimulus orders for the STOP and MID tasks. Um, we have the different domains that, that these tasks are supposed to be touching, reward processing, uh, motivation, impulsivity, impulse control, memory, uh, emotion regulation. And then uh, on here, you can, you, can, you, can, you can see the types of processes that are being tapped into, anticipation and outcome of reward, um, anticipation of responding for an outcome, again, impulsivity, impulse control, conflict monitoring, working memory, um, emotional regulation and reactivity, et cetera. And there are several neural correlates that are expected from these domains as well. Now there's some good news. I guess some good news and some bad news, so to speak. The tasks are, have, are relatively robust. Uh, this is of a, a paper that Hugh Garaband's group is working on currently, but the, the many of the contrasts are relatively robust. On the left, you can see contrasts for both cortical and subcortical contrasts for stop versus go on the SST and incorrect stop versus correct go on the SST. Um, and also correlations with, of the task activity with performance. The good news is, is that because task fMRI is within subject, um, the re reliability of reproducibility of these task activations can be done with the relatively few participants. And that is shown over here in E. Again, where you take, where you try to um, take a gold standard uh, data set and identify how many, how many subjects it takes to be able to kind of replicate or um, show reliability between subsamples of a different data set. And so that's what this is showing. You, uh, you have the solid lines are the, the correct, the solid red lines are the correct stop versus correct go. The solid blue line is the incorrect stop versus correct go. And then you have the um, correct stop versus correct go. It's a dotted red line. Incorrect stop versus uh, correct go is the dotted blue line. Um, but you can see relatively good reproducibility with relatively small sample sizes or reasonable size sample sizes um, that in, in E. Because a little trickier when you look at the, the relationship of doing that same type of that same type of experiment correlating the uh, the performance relative to the task activations, you see a rapid rise in reproducibility, but as you can see, the correlation from one data set to the to the next. Um, is much lower, and, and this is likely due to um, the small effect sizes. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. So this is for the SST. Here are images, the same types of images for the MBAC, very robust for, um, for the task activations. There, it is also robust for the, the correlations across the, the performance, but um, quite a bit weaker, just as we saw earlier. And you can see the different types of contrast that you can, you've seen here. This is for the memory portion, so zero back versus fixation, two back versus fixation, two back versus zero back, et cetera, cortical and subcortical. 
Remember, this is an emotional end back. So this is the <clears throat> a couple of extra um, um, things can be done. So faces versus places, and then uh, negative versus neutral face and positive face versus neutral face. Uh, again, we won't go over, I won't go over this all in detail, but the data are relatively robust, but it also highlights um, some, some pitfalls that we have to be careful about when conducting analyses, looking at some of the other complex behaviors and clinical outcomes we care about um, in the study. Here are the same results for the MID. Um, again, this is anticipation of large reward versus neutral, et cetera, et cetera. And similar types of reproducibility for this task for the, the common contrast uh, that we we'll be looking at for the task of MRI studies as well. Okay, let's walk through some of the minimally uh, processed um, pipelines. All right, so most of what we'll be talking about here can be seen in a nice uh, uh, paper by Don Hagler et al. Uh, and Sean uh, Hatton. In fact, most of the slides for what I'll be showing you here today is created by these two who have been um, doing a heroic job of getting these data out um, to the NDA and to the public um, in these various forms. Okay, structural MRI, uh, T1 weighted and T2 weighted scanning. Okay, so there are several several relatively vanilla traditional processing steps that occur with the structural scans. There's gradient nonlinearity distortion correction for T1 and T2. And that's part of the minimally processed data that you can get on the NDA. The registration of the T2 images, the T1, based on mutual information, uh, bias field or intensity, non-uniformity correction, using white matter bias correction uh, based on tissue segmentations and sparse spatial smoothing. This is something that's relatively unique to ABCD processing. There's a, uh, a resample into rigid body um, or in, into rigid body registration with a custom atlas with a one millimeter isotropic voxels, uh, brain segmentations and cortical surface reconstruction from T1 images using FreeSurfer. Um, in, in, the, in the originals were version uh, 5.3. There are several derived measures that come from these, uh, that comes from this pre-processing. So morphometric measures, cortical thickness, area, volume, suckle depth, gyrification, image, in image intensity measures, um, and cortical, with regard to cortical contrast. There's uh, surface ROIs for these measures are using the standard free surface parcellations and subcortical ROIs um, in volumes. All of this, these data are provided via the, um, the tabulated data on the NDA. For diffusion tensor imaging and restricted spectrum imaging. Okay, processing here, tr again, relatively traditional head motion correction. Um, there's correction of spatial distortions. There's a robust diffusion tensor estimation registration of T2 weighted uh, B0 images, and these are all resampled into standard orientation. There are several derived measures from, from the diffusion that's available via tabulated data as well. Um, obviously the, the, the estimated principal diffusion orientations, fractional anisotropy, um, you know, mean, radial, and axial diffusivity, et cetera. And then from the um, restriction, and then also the restriction spectrum imaging, um, which is slightly different than what folks are typically used to, but is um, important for restrict identifying or characterizing restricted or hindered diffusion within individual voxels um, and intra intracellular and extracellular signal fractions. Um, there are several average diffusion derived measures, white matter tracks, subcortical gray matter structures, uh, and again, via these cortical parcellations from preserver.
resting state fMRI. So like the diffusion data, um, there's B0 distortion correction using reversing gradient methods, um, gradient nonlinear distortion, head motion correction, and registration to a T1. And that is the, the gist of the minimally free process data for fMRI. Now there are some additional, for the tabulated data, there's some additional resting fMRI, um, you know, things that are done specifically uh, in addition. So there's a, a removal of some initial volumes. There's the data are filtered, um, regressed thought, there's signal regression with regard to motion, mean white matter, ventricles, whole brain. Uh, data are censored for excessive motion at a frame wide displacement of 0 0.2 um, and requiring at least five contiguous frames. Um, the motion data are, are the motion values themselves are filtered for respirate for respiratory signals and then there's also a, a bandpass band pass filter. The frame censoring is based on the 2014 Power et al. Uh, paper and the motion filtering, which I'll describe a little bit more uh, later, is based on a, a recent paper that we have published highlighting the signal artifacts from respirations in the motion estimates themselves. And then the data is resampled into voxel time series data um, and, and put into uh, the surface mesh vertices uh, for examination. There are, so for the tabulated data, it's done based on seed-based correlation analyses. The, the parcellation that's used for the resting state data is based on the paper by Gordon et al. and Shubha Cortex in 2014. Uh, uh, time series are averaged within the cortical and subcortical, within the cortical ROIs, subcortical ROIs bleed from free surfer. Pairwise correlation between ROIs are then conducted to generate matrices. There are some tabulated information, including the correlation within and between these predefined networks from that Gordon et al. paper. Um, and there's correlation between each of those and subcortical ROIs as well. Oh, it's going backwards here. All right. So for the task fMRI. So again, the, there's just a few additional things. I've talked about the tasks themselves, but we'll just talk a little bit about the, the, um, the processing. So this is, there's a few task specific processing um, items that will be important for everyone to know. You can see what those are there, I don't need to repeat it. And then there's to the task activations are, are identified with the GLM using um, AFNI's 3D deconvolve. And again, you, there are frames that are a greater than of FD of 0.9 uh, um, are censored from, from the model that's based on a paper by Siegel et al. And, and human brain mapping. And you can see all the details of how the modeling is actually acquired here. Um, from there, there's you know, the GLM coefficients and, and the T statistics are sampled onto the cortical service for um, analyses that can either be vertex-wise or, um, or region-wise. And ROI analyses are done with the subcortical segmentations and anatomical parcellations. Um, there are a few um, performance, you know, um, considerations. The you know there of folks who have been excluded. Um, due to behavior and MID, it's, it's about 6.3%. Uh, the, the SST, 11%, and NBAC, 15%. 15 Why? And improving on these numbers is, is an ongoing effort within the consortium. There are several future um, you know, developments for pipeline development. Um, where there's always a continuing enhancement of processing and uh, uh, QC processing, um, better visualizations for QC, 
um, some additional tweaks and updates. The diffusion um, pre-processing is ongoing. Um, additional enhanced motion correction. The next round will likely be moving to FreeSurfer 6. There are, there's now a push to, um, for fast track data to be, um, for fast track data to be put into bids format and some of the derived, and, and some of the derived data, um, for example, from PreSurfer. Um, and there's several other longitudinal metrics now that half of the wave two data are now in, in the release 3.0. Um, and, and then some between scan uh, correction um, developments. All right, and now I'll talk the, in this last piece, just talk quickly for the last approximately 15 minutes about some other resources that are available for, for, the, for folks interested in using this data set. One of them is called the uh, ABCD Bids, we call the ABCD Bids Community Collection. It's in the NDA under collection 3165. Okay. So the ABCD, uh, ABCD data collection 3165s, uh, the ABCC analytic utilities and the analytic utilities were designed for a few things. One is to supplement the current data sharing um, that is currently going on in, a, in an ac accessible platform for community sharing of derived data via, um, um, via this, uh, an NDA bids prepare and upload tool. Um, it will assist investigators in conducting new analyses using software packages designed for the collection and provide you know, integrated data and analytic utilities for, to verify some, some findings. A couple of the links if you want to learn more about this collection and how it's used are, are below. And there's currently a pu publication that's being put together that will uh, hopefully shed some more details on it's it, what it is and, and how you can be used. So <clears throat> the, it, the, the, this community collection does allow for, through some of the information on, these, on the docs here, does allow for the community contributions and usage um, that with standard formatting and a, a governance structure for contributions, i.e. bids derivative structure, to make, but it's, and it does so through the NDA to main, maintain compliance with the NDA's important data standards. So any individually derived data from outside, from folks outside the community, or from folks outside the um, um, ABCD proper will, will have to share that data through the NDA. And this is um, one resource that can help with that distribution. So it is built on the bid standard um, and the, there are several tools to assist folks in the community that are downloading from the, the, the ABCC, want to convert their data to bids, and for, and for actual contribution. So there's, there's a, an NDA ABCD S3 downloader that allows for, for users to pull down very specific bids derivatives files from this collection, including free surfer data, connectivity matrices, and things of that nature. There's a ABCD DICOM to bids that is, it's a, it's a, a piece of code that allows for easy conversion of DICOM to bids for data that is in, um, that is, that is on fast track. Although now we're working to move, change fast track, all the fast track data into bids compatible data. There's a, what's called a file mapper. So it's a, it's a program that allows users to and actually convert their, their standard outputs into bids uh, formats or bids derivatives formats um, consisting with the, the, the rules of bids derivatives for upload. Uh, and then there's some code in, that allows for easy, um, um, easy upload of bid style data to the, to the ABCC. Uh, there are several utilities that are in the, the ABC, ABCC that are, I'll go over here. One is an, an alternative pipeline called the ABCD Bids uh, Pipeline. It is a containerized software with standard inputs and a minimalized, minimalistic uh, interface. Uh, in Docker, it's based on the human connectome, based on the human connectome pipelines with some modifications to work with 
ABCD data and other types of data. So in that case, it's split into the processing is split into um, these six these six different bins. So there's pre-free surfer, which includes um, takes bids inputs, does a lot of registrations and things of that nature. The free surfer, um, the free surfer section, free surfer section, a post free surfer section, which begins to generate outputs in a SIFTI format, which is consistent with the human connectome um, project. There's a fMRI volume, which does a lot of the similar types of volume um, pre-processing of fMRI data that was that we I, we had talked about earlier. And then the data are they go through uh, they go through a what's called fMRI surface where all of the data are pushed into a standardized format in SIFTI formats with cortical and subcortical structures uh, for for all of the all of the all of the bold data as well. And then last is a is a pre-processing uh, functional connectivity pre-process specific pre-processing module that does the many of the same pre-processing steps that we talked about earlier, but using the SIFT and HTTP style formats. The, again, the, the pipelines are, are very minimalistic. They run as a, a, as a bids app. So they run via Docker with um, very limited requirement for inputs, but several options that can be, can be um, added as well. There are several features or differences with these pipelines relative to the Human Connectome project. Um, it, well, first it will detect any modality configuration. So however, the different types of data were collected. There are some modifications in pre and post free surfer to improve performance and for registration, segmentation and other, you know, um, other aspects of the data. There's, an, uh, there's some options to use study specific templates for improved masking and nonlinear registration and for populations with aging populations with large ventricles and and other uh, deformations it's it's helpful for for those types of circumstances we've added this functional connectivity preprocessing module and included some some um, functionality to reduce the respiratory artifacts via, uh, via this filter I'll, I'll talk about in a second, and then a quality control uh, image module for easy, easy viewing and examining of your post-process data. The, the pipelines work with uh, ABCD data, work with legacy and non-ABCD data acquisitions, works with specialized populations, like I said um, earlier um, as well. This is an example of two, two things. One is the types of outputs you can expect to kind of look at the quality of your data. These are called gray plots, um, and they allow you to take one big snapshot of all your bold data where you can identify very specific artifacts um, in your data, typically related to motion. Um, the bottom trace there is the frame displacement trace that's looking at the motion. This, this is of a given subject. Um, and what you can see here is that the motion looks quite high for this subject. A lot of that, it turns out, it's likely due to resp respiration artifacts where you have B0, uh, B0 changes to the moving of the chest wall. That is not real movement. It's going to be seen by the red arrows um, there that would typically be removed if you're with standard, the standard cutoffs. But filtering out that, that respiratory artifact um, allows the data to align more closely to real uh, motion artifacts, which, are, which we can see clearly with the, with the black arrows. So these kind of images, um, with and without the filter, are pro all provided so you, so you can see the quality of your data. Now, there are some, a bunch of other, in the, what we call the executive summary, a bunch of other um, measurements that are available to look at the quality of your data, including uh, a mosaic of your image with the free surfer reconstructions on them to make sure your free surfer re reconstructions were of work um, of high quality. And some other things to set your eyeballs on, like the, for the registration of the T1, T2, for the bold, the quality of your target image for registration, and things of that nature, and, as well as the gray plots for all the different types of images.
All right. So <clears throat> there are a few additions that are, that are being worked on for the, for the current year and then also into 2021. The, the pipelines should be compatible with fMRI prep, which should be available this winter, uh, in all, as well as QSI prep, uh, a, an effort out of the uh, Satterthwaite lab at, uh, at Pennsylvania. Um, and there's also a task module update. So the task data isn't currently available, but it should be relatively soon. And that's um, work out of Hugh Garaband's lab in, in uh, Vermont. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that I wanted to be um, sure to note on this uh, talk was related to you know, some considerations of how to utilize the data and all the, all the things that we've, what we've seen here. And so what's been in the, I would say in the news recently with regard to imaging data is relates to our often reproducibility failures. There's a, a very popular paper that describes how, it describes how that can be from di just, just different ways that people analyze data. And there's another paper that's recently, that's been, it's under review that's recently come out that's highlighted how, because uh, that how this can, this can occur and it's simply because of what's called sampling variability. Okay, and in, in this in this work, um, what uh, what this what Scott Merrick and had done was examine the you know the correlations of all different types of measures of our you know of the that measure cognitive ability, psychopathology, etc., with both measurements of cortical thickness and resting state functional activity. And the gist is that, is if you do this across a large, large sample, like ABCD, the largest univariate effect size that you, you actually obtain is about 0.16, okay? If you look at the top 1% of, top 1 of connections or relationships of, in this case, with cortical thickness, it's about, it's 0.06 with a median of 0.01. In other words, that the, the effect sizes that we're looking at with brain imaging data when you're doing brain behavior correlations is very, very, very small and will require large, large sample sizes. So one of the things that is also available via this ABCD bids community collection is what we're calling ARMS or the ABCD, ABCD reproducible match samples. The idea here is that if we can match the samples across many, many measures, in this case, lots of demog the demographics, age, gender, handedness, um, a lot of race characteristics. We in, in match them very strongly. Then we have two nearly identical samples, in this case, of well over 5,000 participants that can be utilized to replicate a given finding from one sample to another and used in other ways as well. I'll give you, I'll give you a few examples here. Some of this data is now this these samples and in, in, in how they're put together to get matched, also matched on family structure and twin status and things of that nature as well. But these these um, matched samples are also available via the ABCC for folks to utilize to, you know, identify if a given finding is reproducible, which those prior papers show are is, is a really really important consideration, particularly if we're subgrouping or looking at. Um, outcomes in the ABCD sample that don't have, don't, aren't quite to, a, don't have quite a very large sample um, yet. <clears throat> All right, there's a few additional um, resources and utilities. So the gist is that, so these, these types of brain-wide association studies that were described in those prior, patient, prior papers often take, must take into account covariates that impact various types of analyses of interest. Right now, the ABCD study contains several um, covariates that are normally independent, but in this case are are nested. You know, so for example, from the twenty one sites, um, we have MRI data is acquired across three different um, different platforms. As a result, you know the site and platform effects are likely to impact the measured data, um, but because not all dependent measures are overlapping. That, in other words, not every site has a different scanner platform, that the covariance structure of the data is actually nested. So typically this kind of nested covariance can be dealt with with linear mixed models. Um, but because imaging data sets um, are 
huge and have tens of thousands of data elements for imaging data set, the size and complexity requires these really computational intensive analyses to do the, the do the an analytics correct, do the analytics correctly, um, sometimes over a billion data points. And so adjusting for these um, statistical significance in this scenario, it can be very difficult, particularly when you're using things like permutation testing um, and things like that with all these different types of covariates and nested variables, the estimates become less reliable. Okay, so the what what we've been able, what we've done and is beginning to is, has now been implemented is using this marginal model approach. Um, that is it's a software package for testing brain behavior associations in large studies like ABCD using a sandwich, you know, that's called a, using a sandwich estimator. So it's called the sandwich estimator for neuroimaging data or SEND. Now the, the sandwich estimator is relatively straightforward. You, in essence, construct a marginal model. You, you, you know, to look across all of your matrices or your vertices and surface or volume using SIFTI or volume voxel-wise data. You, you, if you have network information, you also, also can test for enrichment to see if a given network is, 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 has a, um, a significant relationship to whatever outcome you're looking at. And then there's a, a permutation angle where you try to develop a null model. Now, instead of using permutation testing, you're using wild bootstrap and it's done on the residuals. But in essence, it's a, it's a way to do, um, to do, um, strict uh, significance testing using a num model generated from your own data. And again, en enrichment can be done there. But the point here is that with this marginal model, you can do similar types of analyses that you would do with traditional mixed models, but the, the ability to do it on this large data sets like ABCD becomes much more feasible uh, because the computations need to do it are, are much less. The performance is much higher. So that's also available on this for folks to be able to use. Now there's some other important uh, sample characteristics for folks to, to know. So motion, motion, motion. Motion is a big problem in all of our data, particularly these developmental samples. Um, here, we're just showing how, the, how motion can be affected by, how it, motion affects its sight. Um, it's, there's um, small race effects that there's the PCs. These are, these are the components um, from a paper by Wes Thompson. Um, looking at general ability, executive functions, things of that nature. Um, parent education, gender, ethnicity, age, all these things affect motion. So it's, it's really important that you're we're thinking about this when running, running any type of analyses. Um, because there's lots of motion, that also means that the samples, once you're correcting for, for motion artifacts, particularly in the, in the bold data, um, get reduced quite a bit. So this is just an example of those two different matched ABCD data sets on the left here, group one and group two, um, that after a conservative motion correction, you're, we're, um, we have a, a reduction, a, quite a bit of reduction of, of current data um, available. Um, recovering some of that data is, is an, ongo an ongoing effort in the consortium. The good news is that if you examine the data across these two different split data sets, these ARMS data sets, you see lots of, you see high reliability. So on the, on the left is just an A is, is examining just the average correlation matrix between um, all the participants in ABCD1 versus ABCD2, and you can obtain nearly identical point estimates. That same thing can be examined on the left with cortical thickness. Um, and the variance that you'd expect across the different samples. So the data is, is quite strong and, and quite reliable at this level. But again, there are some things you, uh, you know, that we really do have to consider. So this is just one example of some, something to think about for the group. So this is looking at the, the relationship of every connection in the brain with functional connectivity as a function of a general ability um, from, the, from the data and to see how well that can reliably be estimated across the two different data sets. On the top, you have from ABCD1 and A and ABCD2 and B and the differences in C. And there's some general, st generally strong reliability um, up to an, an R of 
uh, r squared of 0 0.6, 0 0.67. But as you can see in D and E, where we're looking at the left, at least 10 minutes of good data and the right, um, five minutes of good data, that you need, you need thousands of subjects to be able to reach that level of, reach that level of reliability. The data line there is about 80%, is 80 percent of the peak. And what that's, what that's telling you is that um, with, uh, to reach 80 percent of that, reach 80 percent of that peak, if, you, if for subjects that only have five minutes of good data, um, you need almost you need to um, um, you need about 500 or more um, participants, which is which is a big deal, largely because the data are likely to be a little bit more noisy. So lots of considerations, things to think about when we're trying to um, generate new analyses with these data. Now the the other consideration is the reliability of the measures you're measuring your brain imaging measure against. So on the top is just a repeat of the of the of what I of general ability the measurement I just showed you on top on um, in the previous slide, in C and D and E and F. Um, C D is looking at that same thing with executive function and E and F looking at that same thing with with regard to learning ability, and here what you can see is that the ability to reach um, significant reliability is 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 much weaker. This is likely because the reliability of the outcome measure, in this case, executive function and learning ability is, is weaker as well. So um, again, we're dealing with relatively small effect sizes. It's gonna require large data, it's gonna require large data sets to get reliable results. And the, the gist here is that despite all of the efforts, you know, to maximize our signal, uh, due to remaining noise and sampling variability, in, in the population. Our studies in ABCD are gonna require these very big sample sizes and, and group membership. So I'm gonna end there. Hopefully we, you were able to learn a little bit about the imaging protocol and the, and the sequences, how quality control has been doing, has been being done, uh, the fMRI tasks, the minimally processed pipelines in this, in this new um, AB, ABCC collection, collection 3165. Now there are places to get help. Um, ABCD issues is a is is your friend for when you need um, some. You have questions on a lot of the stuff that I talked about today. There's also a DAIC release email list, which can be seen uh, below. And then the last, of course, is at the NDA. There is they are enormously good at, and responsive at getting back to folks when questions are, are required about ABC, ABCD or other NDA related issues. So um, again, they're an enormous resource and their information is there as well. All right, um, that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Bye now.